Ephesians. And we are presently in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 22 through 33. Uh, again, now remember, we were looking at part of this last week. And really what this represents, it represents the greatest treaties on marriage and the marriage relationship that you can find anywhere in the Bible or outside of the Holy Scriptures. And so what we're looking at is really a very basic formula. Uh, it's basic but beautiful. It simply would instruct us, wives submit, husbands love. And remember the addition to those thoughts, wives submit as the church submits to Christ, and husbands love as Christ loves the church. And so, you know, you think about this, the stability, the success, the strength of your marriage depends upon this formula. Uh, love, we're going to see tonight from husbands, and of course, Titus 2, verses 4 and 5 teaches the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children. So love's just not confined to the husbands, but love, we're going to see, it's not optional. But it is optimal. It really helps us get the very best out of marriage. If you want your marriage to be the best it can be, if you want as a wife to be happier than you ever thought you could be, if you want as a husband to be happier than you ever thought you could be, then let's follow what the scriptures tell us to do. Wives submit, husbands love. Now, Let's do this. We're going to go back through this. I did delete some of the slides from last week, but I kept some of these in here also. Quickly notice this. It has been admired by every generation, but unfortunately practiced by none. Now, we're applying that to Ephesians 5 right now, verses 22 through 33. Originally, J.W. McGarvey said that about 1 Corinthians 13 that great chapter of love. His take on that was, it's been admired by every generation, but unfortunately practiced by none. I think as we apply that to 1 Corinthians 13, we certainly can apply it to Ephesians 5. You know, a lot of people come to Ephesians 5 and they think that's just a beautiful saying. It has some glorious sentiments, but are they going to do what the Bible tells them to do? No. They've got a better plan. And you see where that plan leads as you look across our society today. So again, remember that quote as we continue to study. Now, what these verses can do quickly, strengthen every marriage, even strong ones. There's not one marriage in here, I don't care how strong it is, it can't become stronger. And so these verses can help us do that. It can provide the necessary ingredients for marital joy and happiness. That's exactly what God is trying to do. If we'll let him, if we'll listen. Uh, number three, define the God-given roles and expectations for husbands and wives. We've already mentioned that. Wives submit, husbands love. Again, what else it can do? Put an end to the marriage go round. It can help us secure, as we've said, and strengthen and stabilize our marriage. It can inspire and motivate us to be the kind of husbands and wives we ought need to be. And number six, cause us to ask a serious question in light of marriage. Am I, quote, walking like the world in my marriage, or am I walking like a child of God with my husband and wife? with my husband or wife. Now, think about this. Go to the book of Ephesians. I want to show you again why we chose that term walking. Seven walks throughout the book of Ephesians. Some of them are telling us how not to walk or how we used to walk. Some of them are encouraging us how to walk in a very positive light. Again, when we look at marriage, when we think about walk, and again, the term walk, it means conduct. How are we walking? How are you conducting yourself? Is it like the world? Are we disobeying what God has to say here in Ephesians 5? Or is it like a child of His? 
an obedient child, 1 Peter 1 and verse 14. But, but look at this. Ephesians 4, read with me verses 17 through 19. Here's, here's a great depiction of walking like the world. And Paul is saying, don't do this. Don't, don't do this any longer. Look what it says in verse 17 of chapter 4. This I say therefore in testifying the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, lewdness to work all to work all uncleanness with greediness. Paul says, let's stop walking like that. Peter will say something similar in 1 Peter 4 and verse 2. You know, when he tells us not to live this life for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Look at Ephesians 5 and verse 2. Here's the other walk, like we said, are we walking like this, like children of God? Pick up verse 1 also, verses 1 and 2 of Ephesians 5. Therefore be imitators of God, now notice this, as dear children. Now what does that imply? Look at verse 2. And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And so in light of everything that we have talked about, everything we will, again, how are we walking? Is it like the world with respect to marriage? Or is it like God's obedient child? Let's do this. We're going to read this, and then we'll come back, okay? Now notice, we're going to read again three verses that pertain to the wife. And then nine verses that have something to say to the husbands. Now I'm sure a lot of you would know why there are only three to the wives and nine to the men. You know, I've already been told at different occasions that we're a little bit slower, so we need a little bit more instruction. I beg to differ with that. I think, I think the Holy Spirit knows that we as husbands are dealing with the most difficult partner in marriage. So we need more help. I'm just kidding. I hope you, have a, hope you have a good sense of humor tonight, you know. But look at verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, we looked at this last week, okay? And really, here's sort of the summation. Now, I want you to see something here. God's plan for wives, look at how simple this is. Really, this takes us to verse 22. The requirement stated, subjection. Verse 23, the reason, husband is head. That's why, that's the reason given. And in verse 24, the result in everything. Really, verse 24 sums up, it sort of reemphasizes what verse 22 and 23 have already said. But it adds this, in everything. Now listen to what I'm about to say. Because God is very fair, okay? In everything. Having read that regarding the wives... We're about to turn our attention to the husbands and once again, both to the wives and both to the husbands. There is total denunciation that is required by each. The wife is to subject herself to the husband. How and how much? In everything. The husbands are to love their wives. How deeply, how much? In everything. Total self-denunciation. If every wife would do that and devote herself to the husband, if every husband would do that and devote himself to his wife, then guess what? 1 Corinthians 7, verses 33 and 34, the husband would be pleasing his wife and the wife would be pleasing her husband. That marriage would be solid. 
it would be strong. Look at this. I, I ran across this quote last week. I didn't share it with you last week, but, but look at this. And now keep this in mind with the concept of subjection. Because today in our society, this is the bitter pill, it seems like, for people to swallow. Subjection. But you know what? In the first century, what was even more foreign when they heard this originally was not what was told the wives, but what was told the husbands. You can go back and look at Greco-Roman literature. And it's not enjoined upon the husband to love his wife. That was a startling truth in the first century. And once again, if we would look at this in its historical setting, we would acknowledge finally that the Bible has done more to elevate the role of woman than any other book known to man. But notice this. I love this quote. If two men ride on the horse, one must ride behind. Shakespeare said that. Now think about the common sense behind this. If two men ride on the horse, one must ride behind. It's just, again, a practical observation. And when you apply it to the home, again, there has to be one head. There has to be one who in turn will follow. And the one riding on the horse, the one behind, it's not because his horsemanship is inferior. This is just a practical requirement. You can't both sit in the same seat on the horse. And so as logical as that is, if we go to God's Word and apply that same kind of logic with respect for His Word, we're not going to be kicking and complaining, either wives or husbands, about what He's told us. Now, here's what we're going to look at right now. Verses 25 and following. Now, the flip of the coin. Husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present, to her, uh, present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Verse 31. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respect her husband. Now keep in mind what we pointed out last week. Even though application is being made to husbands and wife, the marital union, Paul is speaking first and foremost about Christ and his church. This is true, first and foremost regarding Christ and his church. And of course, the application can be made, must be made to husband and wife. Now, let's go back and we'll pick it up again in verse 25. Again, notice what we have here. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, let me make this statement as we get into this. Husbands, let's not ever, let's not ever come to Ephesians 5 and use this beautiful context as a club to demand that our wives submit to us. Husbands, you can't force submission. You can't demand submission, but by your devotion to her, you can, quote unquote, if you want, earn it, okay, as you love her, as Christ loved the church. 
Let me make a couple statements. We didn't deal with this in any depth last week, and we can't now either. But remember the reason why wives are to be in subjection. Because the husband is head of the wife. Sometimes I've seen men who take that biblical truth and twist it and pervert it. They distort it. Remember what Peter says in 2 Peter 3? They twist the scriptures to their own destruction. Well, many men have twisted that truth to their marriage destruction. Saying, you need to be in submission. Is that true? Yes. Yes. But husbands, why don't we, why don't you do what Jesus teaches us to do here, which allows her gratefully, wholeheartedly, to put herself in subjection to you. Love her. Love her as Christ loved the church. Understand what love means. Understand what headship means. Being head of the home does not mean whatever I say goes. You know, I, I have the first word, I have the last word, and that's it. Nobody else says anything else. Jesus is head of the church. There's no doubt about that. Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23, earlier Paul taught that. Colossians 1 and verse 18, that he might have preeminence in all things. He is the head of the body. There's no doubt about that. But the question we need to ask is, how? How is he the head? As head, how does he relate to his wife? over which he is head. Remember some, the only thing they think about headship is, I have all authority. And is that not true about Jesus as head? He has all authority. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Matthew 28 and verse 18. So as we think about this, yes, headship does mean authority, but that one who is head, Jesus, that one who has all authority, he also says, I am among you as he who serves. Luke 22 and verse 27. Remember Matthew 23 and verse 11? If you want to be great in the kingdom, be the servant of all. That's what Jesus taught. That's what Jesus was about. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20 and verse 28. Isn't that what this context is all about? Jesus as head, having all authority, he didn't come to be served. He didn't say, I am demanding everybody give me the respect that I deserve. Well, again, we love because he first loved us. 1 John 4 and verse 19. And remember, the love of Christ controls me, having concluded this. One died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. That's the compelling force in our lives. That's the controlling force in our life. Not simply his authority, that's true. But it's his love. His love. You know... That's what really breaks down the barrier, isn't it? From us being stubborn and rebellious to finally saying, now I see, now I understand. Now I want to obey him because of his love. Turn with me quickly. Turn with me quickly to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, we're turning here, men, because we need to hear this, okay? 2 Chronicles 10. We're going to read verse 7, and remember this context, Rehoboam has become king, Solomon has passed, the people come to Rehoboam with evidently, and I preface this, I qualify it, evidently a legitimate request. They said, you know, Rehoboam, your father was hard, he was difficult, will you just lighten the load some for us? Well, Rehoboam, it seems like, wanted to make the best decision he could. Here's one of the biggest, one of the most important decisions yet of his new regime, of his new reign. 
And so he wants to make a good decision. He, he asks, you know, the older men, and they're going to tell him something. He's going to ask the younger men, and the younger men are going to tell him. <laughs> you remember what the younger men say? You, you tell him, you think my father was tough? You know, you haven't seen anything yet. That's, that's what they were going to say. I'm the authority. I'm the head. I'm the king. Who do you think you're talking to? Don't come to me with these petty grievances. I'll make it even harder on you. Well, the older men, here's the advice that they gave. And we're also going to see why they gave this advice. Men, here's the point. Here's one of the greatest verses, if you'll remember this, this principle. Then couple it with Ephesians 5. And love your wives as you should, as we have been taught. You'll see you make it so much easier for her to be in subjection to you. It's not going to become a burden. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 5 and verse 13. That'll be the attitude of our wives when we say, I know I'm to live in subjection, but I can easily do that for this one because he loves me. He loves me as Christ loves his bride, the church. But look at these words, 2 Chronicles 10 and verse 7. Some of the best advice that was never heeded. Okay? This advice wasn't heeded and it led to the divided kingdom. Here it is. And they spoke to him saying, If you are kind to this people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. Rehoboam, you want to establish your throne? They, the older men in wisdom, says, here's how. You be kind to them. You grant them this petition. They're implying that, you know what, Rehoboam, they've got a legitimate complaint. Your father was tough. And so lighten the load. Be good to them. Be kind to them. Speak kind words right now, and they'll follow you your whole life. They'll be in subjection to you. But of course, he wasn't going to have any of that. He was king. And he thought the best route to go was to make sure right now they knew who was king. Well, he was no longer king over them. They left. They said, we don't have a share anymore in Israel. So Jeroboam began to lead them. And remember what the Bible says about Jeroboam who made Israel sin. Sad, sad context. Husbands, love your wives. Again, this is written in the Greek in the imperative mode. And that mode is not optional. It is stressing a command. Again, this is commanded. Husbands, love your wives. Not optional, not a suggestion. This is a command, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. You remember earlier when the wives were taught you're to be in subjection as the church? That was their comparison, as the church. Well, here for the men, as Christ, as Christ loved the church. This love, when you look up, 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 yeah, excuse me, upon this love biblically, this is an exalted love. A virtuous woman who can find her worth is far above rubies. Proverbs 31 and verse 10, the, the husband knows that. He understands that. He lives according to that. He exalts her. Why? Because what he has in her is more valuable than jewels, more valuable than rubies. It's an exalted love. It's an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, God says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. It is a sacrificial love. This verse right here, it's a selfless love. Notice, and gave himself for her. Remember John 15 and verse 13, greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. And so that's what kind of love this is. This is a committed love. 
You remember what we're told in Hebrews 13 and verse 5? I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the kind of love that every home should have within it. This is the kind of love that every husband should demonstrate to his wife. It's this kind of love. As Christ loved the church. You remember John 13 verses 34 and 35? A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you that you love one another. By this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. How do we love one another? As Christ loved the church. How do I as a husband love my wife? As Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. We've already read this, but go back. Go back. This has already been hinted concerning. Look at Ephesians 5 and verse 2. We've already read this, but look at this in the same chapter. It says, And walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us. You see, it's already been stated. We're to walk in love. This is not just for husbands, but for all. Walk in love. Why? Because Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Husbands, love your wives. To what depth? To what extent? As Christ loved the church. That doesn't tell me enough. And gave himself for her. That's the kind of selfless, sacrificial love that's enjoined upon us, husbands. Again, I understand, I understand because of our society today that subjection, submission is in some cases a, a quote, tough pill to swallow. But it's only because of the confusion in this world. It's not because of what the Bible teaches about submission. Really, this, this is the tougher of the two commandments for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. That depth makes it difficult and challenging. Now, at any time, any questions, any statements, I've got the microphone. I don't know what I'm doing with it, okay? But I've got it. <laughs> Somebody want to take this microphone and, and give it to Brother Paul? Brother Paul, can you catch? <laughs> throw it? <laughs> I don't think I want to throw it. <laughs> no, Ken, I was, I was thinking about a sister. I ain't going to call her name. I was thinking about a sister in the church and uh, her husband kind of abused her in all kind of ways, but hey, she stood right by him until he, until he died. I mean, stayed right there with him. I mean, she was, uh, uh, you know, a member of the church and uh, she just stood by his side. I mean, she really, uh, what you talking about there? She, she really believed that. And she did that. And uh, uh, I was telling my wife, I said, now, I know that she know her, too. She know the sister, too. But uh, she stood by her husband, you know. Uh, he, he would drink. He would chase women. He would do this here and do that there. Hey, but she, she held her ground. She held her ground, and she stood right there. And she was... Uh, uh, I really uh, admire the lady. I really admire the lady. Okay. okay, as Paul said, you remember in 1 Peter 3, if any wife has an unbelieving husband, it doesn't change what the Bible says in Ephesians 5. It, it's still, he can be one without a word as he observes your chaste and respectful behavior. Remember that meek and quiet spirit is precious in the sight of God. Now, let me also state this. Uh, Bible, the Bible, our God, gives a reason for divorce. And if there is unfaithfulness, if there is infidelity, she or he would have the right, if they wanted to pursue that right, to put them away, okay? And it would not infringe upon their Christ-like demeanor. 
It wouldn't indicate that they didn't believe what the Bible teaches, okay? But again, in situations like that, there's also room and space for forgiveness if that can be done. And so husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, look at verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Here we have why he gave himself, okay? Verse 25 says he gave himself for her. We believe that. We know that. He purchased the church with his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. But why did he do that? Verse 28 begins to explain it. I mean, verse 26 begins to explain it. That he might sanctify and cleanse her. Now think about this. To sanctify, sanctify means to set apart, okay? And so the church, individual Christians have been sanctified. They have been set apart. They've been set apart from this wicked old world that we left. The dominion of darkness translated into the kingdom of God's dear son, Colossians 1 and verse 13. Remember 2 Corinthians 6 verses 17 and following, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I'll receive you. And so they have, they've been set apart. The church has. Think about this. We are taught in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts, meaning set him apart in our hearts as Lord. We sanctify him. He sanctifies us. We set him apart as Lord. He sets us apart from this wicked old world. And so that he might sanctify. That's why he gave himself for us. So that we wouldn't have to live in this world. So that we wouldn't have to live and die in sin. That he might sanctify and cleanse her. Cleanse her. Okay? You know, in Isaiah, hold your place in Ephesians, but look at Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64 I'm going to read verse 6. Look what it says here. This is why we need cleansing, okay? Isaiah 64 and verse 6, it says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. That's why we need cleansing. Because our righteousness... It's like a filthy rag. Read Zechariah, the third chapter, verse 4. Remember Joshua, he's told to take off those filthy garments and put on these bright, clean, new, priestly garments. That's the idea here. The idea of cleansing, okay? And so why did he give himself for her? Why did Jesus lay down his life that he might sanctify and cleanse her. Now notice this, with the washing of water by the word. With the washing of water, this is a Greek word, literally means bath. And so what we're looking at here really is the idea, if you will, of baptism, the, the washing, the cleansing. Remember what Ananias told Saul, why do you delay? Arise, and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Here is that washing. It's a washing of water by the word. That's how we're cleansed. Remember John 15 and verse 3. Now you are clean by the word that I have spoken. That's how we're cleansed. When we hear his word, when we obey his word, when we're washed. Okay? Uh, think about this also. Go back and, and think about this. Look at Esther, the book of Esther. And before she came before the king to be queen, there was six months of purification with oil and myrrh. And then six more months with odors, okay? There was a cleansing. 
And this is the idea here, her, his bride, Jesus' bride, the church, has been sanctified, set apart from this wicked world, and cleansed. How? Well, it's called the washing of water by the word. Remember Titus 3 and verse 5? The washing of regeneration. That's the concept. That washing regenerates. We are baptized into Christ. The old man dies, but we're raised to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. We are regenerated. We're made alive again. And so this is why he gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. With the washing of water by the word, again, here's another reason, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. Stop here for a moment. So that he might sanctify, that he might cleanse, that he might present her to himself. This, this imagery is quite, you know, wonderful. Because Jesus is both the presenter and the receiver. He's presenting her, who? The church, to himself, okay? And, you know, think about this now. Let me find this verse. I think it's in Psalm 45. Go ahead and, and go with me to Psalm 45. I think this is the context that we're looking for. It has, it has a, an allusion, if you will, to what we're looking at right here. Psalm 45 Verses 13 through 15. Listen to this language. Listen to this language. See what it says here. It says, The royal daughter is all glorious, all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you. With gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought. They shall enter the king's palace. And so they are presented in this form, this fashion. Now, I believe this is just talking about presenting to her as, as the bride to him. Remember Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. The bride has made herself ready. A marriage feast is depicted there to... Tell us more about the rejoicing that's going on because Babylon has been dealt with in chapter 18. Now hallelujahs break forth in chapter 19. How do we depict that kind of joy? No better joy in the world than a marriage, than a wedding. And remember what it says, the bride has made herself ready. The bride has made herself ready. How did the bride make herself ready? Well, just like he sanctified her and cleansed her, so that he might present her to himself. She had a part in that too, didn't she? And remember her clothing, her fine linen, is the righteous deeds of the saints in Revelation 19. And so she had a part in this, her obedience. It possibly, I don't think so, but it possibly could be an idea of when he presents the church to his father. Remember 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24. He's going to present the kingdom to God the Father. But I believe in this context, he's presenting the church sanctified and cleansed to himself. He has bought her. He has purchased her. He has given himself for her. Now he's receiving her. And notice he's receiving her a glorious church. A glorious church, not a defiled bride, not an adulterous wife, a glorious church. What makes her glorious? Well, what it goes on to say, not having spot, why not? Because she's been cleansed. Or wrinkle, think about the bride ready to be presented to her husband on the wedding day. She doesn't just go find any wedding dress that's been smashed and, and pull it out and, well, it's wrinkled. Who cares? Who cares? You know, everything's perfect. There's no spot on the dress. There's no wrinkle. Having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But 
that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, whenever I read those words, holy and without blemish, I think about the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Those sacrifices were to be without blemish. She, as she presents herself to her husband, the one who's given himself for her, she's holy. She's without blemish. Having been sanctified from this world, having been cleansed by the washing of water with the word, she's now ready to be presented to her husband, the Christ. Look at verse 28. It says, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And so when it says so, it's talking about in this manner. Just like Jesus loved his bride, just like he sanctified her and cleansed her and was willing to present her to him, in that same manner, husbands, you ought to love your own wives as your own body. Now, I don't believe in this context it's talking about you love her like you love your own body. I think what it's saying is you love her because she is. She is part of you. I think, as we'll see in a moment, this takes us back to the beginning. Eve could have been created by God any way that God wanted to. He could have created her out of stones. Matthew 3 and verse 9. Remember what John said? That, that God can raise up to Abraham children from these stones. He could have made woman from stones. He could have made woman from the dust of the ground like he made man. He could have spoke woman into creation into existence, but he didn't do any of that. He made her from the rib, the rib of Adam. And what did Adam say? This is now bone of my bone. Not, I'm going to love her as I love my own body. I'm going to love her because she is. She is my body. That seems to be the point. As their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. How do we know if we love ourselves? Do you love your wife? This is a lot like Matthew 22 and verse 39. The second is like unto it. Remember the great commandment, the chief? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is enjoining a real biblical self-love, a genuine self-love. But look at verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. And so when he says, for no one ever hated, he's saying, no, you don't hate, but you love. You love. That's the natural you know, response. And he borrows from the nursery. Think about this. He borrows these two terms from the nursery. Nourishes and cherishes. You can go through the Bible and you can find those terms, tender terms, with reference to children, nourished by their parents, cherished by their parents. Again, inspiration uses that for husbands, for us. This is how we love our wives. Nourish and cherish, just as the Lord does the church. Again, here's the reason. Because this is how the Lord loves the church. He nourishes her. He cherishes her, for we are members of his body and his flesh and of his bones. Now this takes it back to what I've already said. The church is the body. Okay, we're connected to Christ. He's the head. We are the body. We are members of his body. Okay, he's the head. And so in that like fashion, she was taken from a rib. And so really when... And notice this. Notice this. When it quotes Genesis 2, this really is prophetic language because Adam had no father and mother. So this is for us. It's for the future, for marriage. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is showing us that from the beginning of time, the relationship, husband and wife, it simply mirrors the relationship of Christ and his church. And look at verse 32. This is a great mystery. 
Great mystery. Remember we've said early on in our study in Ephesians, mystery in the New Testament, it's not something that can't be figured out. It's something that was once hidden, now revealed. And so Paul is helping to reveal the great mystery concerning Christ and his church. When that was spoken in Genesis 2, oh, it applied to Adam and Eve. But it's something once hidden, now revealed. It was speaking more about Christ and his church. Great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And so look at verse 33. Nevertheless, you know, even though this is true, I'm speaking of Christ and his church. Nevertheless, he says, let each one of you. Now, do we hear those words? We talked to wives last week, talked to husbands this week. Every one of us. Let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respect her husband. I don't think we can misunderstand this language, this context, unless we want to. We have to try pretty hard to muddy up this inspired water because it's so plain, it's so simple. And again, when we twist the scriptures, we do so to our own destruction. God's law has always been written, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 24, for our good. That's why God gave us his law. It's for our good. And this is good for your marriage. Let me end with this. John 13, 17. If you know these things, and again, the question tonight, the problem is not knowing this, okay? If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. That's where the difficulty lies. Not in knowing this. You know it. I know it. Are we doing it? If you know these things, blessed or happy are you if you do them. You're not blessed. You're not going to be happy for simply knowing this. You're only going to be happy if, in fact, we do these things. Next Wednesday night, Lord willing, Tyler's going to be teaching again. He's going to be teaching from chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Again, the child-parent relationship. And again, all of this begins back in chapter 5 and verse 21. The idea of being in subjection to one another. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. And again, let's be reading, rereading. Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat>